Hi, this is Stan Bush. Hi, this is Stephanie Calvert. This is John Payne. This is Jack Hughes. Hi, I'm Carrie Stevens. Hey, everybody, this is Prescott Niles. Hello, I'm Kofi Baker. This is Tony Franklin here. This is not a test. This is Play That Rock and Roll. I'm your host, Joe Kay, and our guest today is Guy Evans, author of Nitro, The Incredible Rise and Inevitable Fall of Ted Turner's WCW, and also the co-author of Grateful with Eric Bischoff. Today we are stepping out of our usual subject of classic rock to cover a different media topic that I'm sure many classic rock fans also love. Professional wrestling, in particular, the pro wrestling boom of the 1990s. For those of you who don't know, professional wrestling peaked in popularity in the late 1990s, and that was largely due to a TV ratings battle between Vince McMahon's World Wrestling Federation and Ted Turner's World Championship Wrestling. In the end, Vince McMahon and the WWF, now WWE, would be victorious. But there was a two-year period in which it looked like Ted Turner's WCW might actually win the war. WCW's flagship program was Monday Nitro, which was created and run by Eric Bischoff. The story of Nitro is one of the most fascinating topics in pro wrestling history, and Eric Bischoff is one of the most interesting and also important figures in that story. This brings me to today's guest. In July 2018, Guy Evans published... Nitro, which covers WCW's history under Ted Turner's ownership. That alone was enough to make me want to have Guy as a guest on the show, but then, just last year, he published his next book, Grateful, with Eric Bischoff. This is Eric's memoirs of the last 15 years. It covers his time with TNA Impact, his relationship with Hulk Hogan, and his recent return to the WWE. And it is an excellent follow-up to Eric's first memoir, Controversy Creates Cash. Nitro is one of the most well-researched books, not just about professional wrestling, but media history that I've ever read. And Grateful is about someone who is at the center of that history. So if you want to learn about the professional wrestling boom of the 1990s, you should start right here with Guy Evans. In the interview you're about to hear, we discuss what drew Guy to writing a book about pro wrestling, what sort of research a project like this requires, how Guy avoided the common narratives that often surround WCW, and because we're a music show, I had to ask him about one of the more bizarre aspects of WCW's music library. We also discuss why he started working with Eric Bischoff and how they collaborated on the new book, Grateful. So if you want to learn more about either of these books, you should check out GuyEvansBooks.com. If you go to the website, you can get the new expanded edition of Nitro. You can get signed copies of both books. They even have audiobooks of these now. So if you're interested in getting a copy of these books, check that website out first. Also, be sure to follow Guy on Twitter. He is at Guy Evans Books and also at WCW Nitro Book. If you follow him on Twitter, particularly the WCW Nitro Book account, you will see a lot of great supplemental material that he often posts on a weekly basis and also plenty of deals in regards to these books. So if you follow him on social media, I'm sure you'll find some great prices for these books and also some very cool package deals as well. So without further ado, here's my conversation with the author of Nitro and the co-author of Grateful, Guy Evans. One of my favorite things about the, the Nitro book is the book cover, very um, dynamic uh, photo for the cover. Can you talk about why uh, you picked this picture in particular to use for the cover? 
Yeah, there are a number of reasons, Joe, and thanks for having me on the podcast. It's nice to be talking to you tonight. Um, <clears throat> I suppose, you know, I wanted to choose a picture which was somewhat provocative. And, you know, I think when you look at that cover, of course, you know, it's the final moments of that famous WCW title match at Starcade 98, Kevin Nash and Goldberg, the end of the streak. Um, so I thought it'd be pretty interesting to have that there. Also, that represented um, sort of the midway point of the Nitro era. Of course, the show debuted in September of 95 and the final episode was in March of 2001. So December 98, that's more or less sort of halfway uh, through the time period that the book covers. Um, and I suppose also I was a little bit, um, <laughs> to use a, a British phrase, I was a little bit cheeky with uh, choosing that photo because, because um, I wanted to sort of, um, I, 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 it was done as a kind of a misdirection, I suppose, because I think if you were to pick up the book and you see that picture, you may assume that this is going to be a book all about you know, the creative missteps or the on-screen missteps of WCW. And it's going to be, yes, another account of someone ranting and raving about all of the mistakes that the company made. And granted, they did make a lot of mistakes and that's been covered, you know, elsewhere. Um, but I put that on the front to kind of, I suppose, um, you know, surprise people later on when they open up the book and find out that actually this is a much broader story, I would say, um, more so about the relationship between WCW and its parent company, Turner Broadcasting, was a very dysfunctional relationship, as the book uh, details. Um, and it's also a book, I think, which is as much about its time period, uh, 1995 until 2001, as it is about the subject matter itself. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's kind of what I was going with the cover of the book, to answer your question. Oh, that is excellent. And yes, I am, I'm going to ask about that Um aspect of the book in, in just a moment. Nitro was published originally in, in 2018. Can you talk about what drew you to writing a book about professional wrestling, in particular WCW? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I was someone who, even growing up on the uh, other side of the pond, so to speak, I was someone who was made a fan during the mid to late 90s era, during the Monday Night Wars era. Um, and I actually followed both WCW and the WWF at the time uh, very closely, um, you know, on a on a daily basis, essentially, you know, during that time. And um, once WCW closed its doors, I think, like many other people, I stuck around for a while, perhaps a year or so, to kind of see how they were going to integrate, you know, some of that WCW talent into the uh, WWF storylines. But after about a year or so, um, you know, my interest kind of faded, as I know it does for many wrestling fans at a certain point in your life. Um, you get to a point where you become interested in other things. And, you know, I kind of went on a hiatus of not really paying attention too much to wrestling for um, really the rest of that decade, you know, a period of really eight or nine years. Um, and around, I suppose it would have been 2010, um, if you remember, this was the uh, time where TNA sort of made an ill-fated attempt to oh, reignite yes. the Monday Night Wars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, bizarrely enough, that was kind of what got me thinking about wrestling again, because I had a couple of friends at the time who were saying, like, you know, that I should pay attention to this because it, it's, you know, involving a lot of the um, key faces from the WCW days, both behind the screen and, and on screen there now involved with this upstart company TNA and apparently trying to make a run of it again and go, going up against uh, the WWE. And um, obviously that experiment didn't last very long, but that's kind of what got me thinking about wrestling again. And I started revisiting, you know, some of those old shows and catching up on, you know, what were some of the, the talent who were involved back then? What were they up to now? And you know, all the things you kind of do after you've um, gone on hiatus from being interested in something for a period of time. And then as time went on, I started digging into, you know, some of the documentaries and other books that were written about WCW. And as someone who had followed it so closely back then, I found all of those things to be, you know, informative and entertaining and interesting. But I did feel 
like there were quite a number of subjects that were left off the table. Um, I, I found it quite curious that a lot of the shadowy figures, let's say, that were mentioned in many of these accounts, whether they be, you know, Jamie Kellner or Harvey Schiller or Brad Siegel, people of, of this nature, we would always hear about how important they were to what happened ultimately to WCW, but we would never actually hear from these people directly themselves. And I suppose I found myself hoping and wanting someone to come along and, and tell the story, you know, from that perspective, to get the input of people who were actually there, both on the WCW side and the Turner side. So to make a long story short, around 2014 or so, I realized that that wasn't going to happen, that, the, you know, the book that I kind of wanted to uh, read probably wasn't going to get written. So I, I thought, you know what, let, let me take a stab at it. And, you know, that turned into a three and a half year odyssey. And finally, the book came out in July 2018. Wow, that is quite a timeline uh, for a project like this. That's awesome. Um, can you talk about uh, some of the actual research that went into the book because that's sort of a theme that is sort of a through line for interviews on this show i really like to highlight projects that go over and above when it comes to going in-depth uh, research uh, on their topics and, and and nitro is just such a phenomenal example of that you know you're, you're talking about it's a it's a three and a half year journey what were some of the things that you were doing to gather this information yes yeah, another great question it's something that really steamrolled over time. I, I think originally my idea was to try to get representation from all of the various divisions that comprise WCW as a company. So I thought, let me talk to someone who worked in marketing. Let me talk to someone who worked in production. Let me talk to someone who worked in PR, so on and so forth. And I'll kind of take all of those opinions and all of that input and, and see what happens. And I think very early on, I realized that if I was going to step into these waters and write about a company that was not only hugely important to you know millions of people at a particular point in time, um, you know both in both in the United States and around the world, um, but also a company that was extremely pivotal and important uh, on a very personal level to all of the people who worked there. You know, of course, there were, you know, a lot of people who uh, never worked again in, in wrestling after WCW closed its doors. And of course, there were quite a number of people who did. But but even so, you know, WCW ending really represented a, a, a huge turning point in their careers and in their lives. And so I realized if I was going to take on the responsibility of doing that, I really had an obligation to really leave no stone unturned. So um you know, my motivation for doing so much research, I suppose, just came back to a simple question, which I would always ask myself, which is basically what happened? And I think that's the job of anyone who's writing a, a, a nonfiction book or, you know, a retrospective piece that's looking at a particular point in time. Your loyalty should be as much as is possible, because, of course, we all have our biases, we all, ha we all have things that naturally as human beings we're going to overlook, not pay enough attention to, and so on and so forth. But as much as is possible, you should be trying to get to the truth. What happened? What actually happened here? So if, if I was delving into, for example, the decision to cancel uh, WCW from the Turner Networks, you know, I thought it would be lazy, quite frankly, and irresponsible just to rely on the pre-existing reporting that was done on that particular subject. Because again, as I mentioned, many of the principal people who were involved in that decision were never quoted uh, you know, in any article or in any book as to what their options were at that particular time, what their motivation was for, for cancelling the show, um, how they look back on the decision all of these years later. So what I really did in the end, you know, to answer your question was to combine, um, you know, input from over 120 former TBS and WCW employees with um, a lot of what I would call kind of objective data, uh, things like financial statements and, you know, company memos and, uh, you know, 
all, all kinds of things which are covered in the book, which really supplement, um, you know, what I was hearing on the other end of the phone or across the, the coffee table from whoever I was interviewing. So if someone was pontificating about WCW's financial performance in the year 1995, you know, I could listen to them and I could take notes and, okay, that's, 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 that's useful. But then I could actually go home and look at WCW's financial statement from the year 1995. Oh. Um, and actually, you know, compare and contrast, let's say. Um, and so by doing that, I think, you know, um, hopefully I was able to present a, a well-rounded picture again of uh, what actually happened um, with respect to, to WCW and this entire story. Absolutely. And I, I particularly appreciate you talk about uh, getting to trying to get to the objective truth of the matter. That leads me to my next question, because... You know, one thing I know about the professional wrestling industry is that it's very um, political. And for those listening, I don't mean uh, right-wing, left-wing political. Political in the sense that most major figures in the wrestling industry are very interested in presenting their points of view uh, of what happened. You know, talking about their truth, which isn't always necessarily the truth. And I suspect there must have been several points where you were talking to multiple different people um, about a specific event and you got multiple different stories uh, based on their own perspectives. So how did you navigate the politics of these situations and determine uh, your, your best read of what actually happened? Yeah, I think, again, as much as is possible, you have to try to keep your guard up and filter out um, opinions from people that obviously are motivated by, you know, personal angst towards a particular person or a particular group of people. Um, there were probably 10 or 15 people that I interviewed for the book whose comments didn't actually make it into the book for that very reason, because, mm. you know, I, I, I knew that what they were saying um, really had no basis in fact. Um, and, you know, again, going back to, I think, what your responsibility is when you're doing something like this, I don't see it as being particularly responsible just to run with every single thing that you're hearing down the other end of the phone. Um, and then, you know, kind of putting your hands up and saying, I don't know, guys, you know, you, you make up your own mind what happened here. Um, <laughs> again, that's, that's, not, that's not an exact science, right? That's, there's sometimes you're not going to get it right. There's sometimes that um, you, as you said, you're presented with a scenario where there may not be an objective record of what actually happened. So for example, right. you know, I think there's, there's a couple of instances like this in the book, right? Where there's uh, a meeting involving, let's say three or four different people. And, you know, there's no recording of that meeting, right? There's no one else other than those people who were in the room. So I think in those kind of situations, you, you try to collate what each of those people have to say about that particular events and and in in those cases you do present it to the reader and say look you know we we, we attempted to speak to to all sides here's what they have to say and i think there are moments in the book where i did try to do that where um you know there are things that certainly you know still to this day up for debate um and i try to let the reader ultimately make up their own mind i think a, a very good example of that would be there's a a, a guy by the name of Stu snyder who was um, really the subject of a lot of conjecture as it related to WCW's cancellation from the Turner Networks and then ultimately its sale to the WWF, um, most notably because of his close association with Brad Siegel, who was running the, the Turner Networks, um, you know, uh, TNT first and then uh, ultimately TDS uh, for much of this time. And, you know, Stu Snyder was someone who worked at Turner Broadcasting, then he worked at the WWF in a very high profile role as its president uh, for a year, and then was, you know, integrally, uh, integrally involved with, um, you know, the, the sale process. And there's been so much sort of that's been alluded to about that and so much, you know, rumor and speculation as to what his role was. And in that particular instance, you know, I was lucky enough to get him on the record to respond to some of these things. And I, I basically 
presented them to him directly. And that's an example of, you know, he was asked the questions, he gave his answers, and I'm, um, it, it's not, you know, it's not up to me to then insert a paragraph at the end of that chapter and say, disregard what this guy says. Here's, here's what I think, right? Right. Um, it's up to it's up it's up to the reader then to take that and to match that with some of the perspectives from other people in the book and and their own prior knowledge about the subject and then make up their own minds. And so, hopefully, that answers your question. It's it's really a balancing act. You know, the things that you can definitively say that happened you know you try to do so and in other instances you just have to let the people involved say their piece and let the reader take it from them oh absolutely yeah that's a very interesting uh way to look at it i've had uh previous authors on the show who've said very similar things when investigating uh historical events where you know the first-hand records are obviously not reliable and there's been so much information that's lost in time Slightly different scenario here, but but not totally, uh, you know, n not totally different. So you know, I, I like that. That's the, the the tone of the book is like this is all the information available. You know, what do you think happened? You know, and, and give it to the readers to to work with. I I, I like that quite a bit. Um, something you mentioned earlier is uh, a, the tendency of a lot of previous books that talk about WCW um, blaming the we'll say TV product as the sole reason for WCW's inevitable uh, collapse and sale. The metrics, as you mentioned, don't always quite line up with that uh, as, as far as pointing to individual, say, pay-per-view moments that were controversial. Why is that such an appealing misconception for so many people who write about WCW and so many fans and what did you do specifically with Nitro to counteract that? Well, what I've always said about this question is two things can be true at the same time, right? So mm. uh, I, I think it would be very difficult for anyone to make the case. Of course, all of this stuff is subjective, what I'm about to talk about, but it'd be very hard for someone to make the case that the on-screen products in the last couple of years, let's say, of WCW's existence uh, was anything close to what it was at its peak, right? Um, of course, there were some great moments sprinkled in here and there. I'm sure some people listening to this who were watching at the time, you know, may recall certain episodes of Nitro, Thunder, certain pay-per-views during that time that may have really been highlights to them. Um, but I think if you look at when the company was clicking and firing on all cylinders, you know, in 96, 97, early part of 98, um, it, it was really a shell of its of itself, you know, by uh, by the year 2000 and early 2001. Um, so I, I do think there is some merit in that, but where it gets difficult, I think, is to try to demonstrate a direct correlation between um, the creative output and WCW's ultimate fate as a company you know in, in other words if you were to follow that logic it would be something like as long as they were booking great wrestling shows they would still be in business and i think you know clearly it's much more complex than that if, if that was the case wwe probably would have gone out of business 15 years ago <laughs> um wwe wwe is in a position now as you very well know and anyone who follows the industry knows that by virtue of uh, how it derives its primary sources of revenue, its on-screen product really is less important than ever. They're not reliant on developing these really compelling storylines that are going to drive people to purchase a pay-per-view or to buy a, a ticket and come to to watch the the shows in the arena. You know, if you just look at the the TV rights deals, if you look at the money they're getting from Saudi Arabia, yeah, if you look are. at the, the fact that a huge a huge chunk of their revenue comes as a result of their legacy programming, which, you know, is decades old programming that's already in the can. And, you know, they're, they're making so much money just off of that as a starting point. Um, it's, I think, too simplistic to say um, it all comes back to the creative. So if you look at the subtitle of the book, you know, it's the incredible rise and inevitable collapse of Ted Turner's WCW. Um, I think that kind of alludes to the fact that 
um, WCW's perception within that particular uh, conglomerate, you know, Turner Broadcasting at the time, was such that um, if there ever was to come a day where Ted Turner himself would lose power in terms of being able to um, have influence over WCW's existence, if ever there came a day where the company, you know, um, really went on a downturn uh, as it relates to its creative and, and financial performance, it was really an, an inevitability that, um, you know, the, the shows would get cancelled. I think sometimes maybe we look at it the wrong way and we say, you know, what could have WCW have done to have, you know, stayed on the air longer? I think an interesting thing to ponder sometimes is to consider that maybe WCW actually did better than, you know, many, many people within that corporate structure ever expected. I don't, I don't think they would have told you in the year of 1992, for example, when, you know, Ted himself was facing repeated demands from many of his, or pleadings, I should say, from many of his executives to get rid of this, this wrestling company. I don't think in 1992 they would necessarily have predicted that the company would be around until 2001. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's different if you're, you know, I've never done this personally, right? But if maybe if you're an independent wrestling promoter and it's, it's very easy for you to kind of categorize, uh, you know, your, your revenue and expenses in that kind of environment, you could say that, yes, the, the quality of the shows is absolutely paramount um, as it relates to your future viability as a company. But as you know, with WCW being, you know, one of 150 subsidiaries of, of Turner Broadcasting and then eventually becoming part of a much, much larger corporate structure, it was uh, much more complex than that. Right, right. Yeah, that is a, a lot of, of history that unfortunately just gets glossed over in so many other narratives um, about the 90s wrestling boom. Um, one last question about WCW before we move on to Grateful. Uh, this is a music show, uh, so I have to ask one music question about WCW, and I want to ask about what is probably the most infamous uh, element of WCW's music library, and that is the bizarre use of sound-alike tracks for various wrestler themes. Uh, Diamond yeah. Dallas Page with Self High Five, which sounds like, smells like Teen Spirit. And... Self High Five. Was it Rick Steiner had the, the song that sounded like uh, Paradise City? When you were doing your research for this project, did you come across any sort of explanations for why these, of all things, were like the way their music department wanted to go, especially at a time when, you know, they were, you know, bringing in, well, they were much more successful um, than, than WWF, but WWF, you know, took a very different strategy for, you know, intro themes. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would actually point you and anyone listening to this to go back and listen to, there was a podcast that I was involved in leading up to the book um, with a, a former uh, feature producer for WCW and actually the voice of the NWO, Neil Pruitt. Um, oh. It's called, uh, yes, it's called uh, Neil Pruitt's Secrets of WCW Nitro. And I wish I could tell you which episode in that kind of catalog, because I think we did about 35 or 40 episodes. I wish I could tell you in which episode we addressed this, uh, or I should say Neil addressed this, but, but it's in there somewhere. And I want to say in one of the early shows. Um, when I asked Neil about this, <laughs> it was quite, quite interesting because, you know, you, you mentioned uh, the existence of a, a music department. And the, you know, there was no music department, right? There was no oh. <laughs> WC, one of the, what, 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 one of the things I think which uh, the book highlights is really the lack of infrastructure that WCW oh. had in, compa in comparison to the WWF, right? So, gotcha. Essentially, the way it, essentially the way it would work is they would pick music 
or themes for wrestlers out of the Turner music production library, right? So that's why a lot of these tracks, if you look at it, are just labeled something generic like track one 114 or something like that because a wrestler would, would come into, uh, you know, the, the production studio and, uh, you know, essentially they would play him a, a bunch of different songs that were already owned by Turner. And as you mentioned, you know, a lot of those songs were, to put it mildly, uh, very reminiscent of uh, <laughs> other, other, other popular music that was out there. And, and that's really a function of the fact that they, to my knowledge, were largely purchasing library music. So, you know, this was music that was um, being put together in certain styles or uh, was really intended to sound like, you know, some of the popular offerings on the market. But basically a wrestler would come in, they would play a bunch of themes and, and you know, there was no kind of notion of we're going to go out and we're going to license, you know, this, this did happen later, granted, but for the most yeah. part, they weren't licensing, you know, music from, um, you know, actual known artists or doing what the WWF did, of course, which was, you know, having their own in-house um, music produced and tailor-made for each wrestler. And I, and I think just to kind of put a bow on this, because it is kind of an important question, because if you look at when the tide really started to turn and the WWF really took off in the ratings, a huge element, I would argue, in the overall presentation of that show and how exciting it was, was the theme music. You know, when the glass broke and Stone Cold came out and he's walking to the ring with a theme that absolutely perfectly suits his character, um, you contrast that to watching WCW where at times you had even some of the most well-known wrestlers coming out to completely generic themes. Um, you know, we could get really technical here, but I, I think the, the, if you look at the, the mixing or the, the relative, you know, volume of um, the, the theme music as compared to the, the noise coming from the ring or noise coming from the crowd on the WWF shows the production quality was just so much higher compared to WCW. Uh, especially towards the end where you could at times barely hear the music or hear even some of the dialogue between characters backstage. So these little things, you know, really added up, I think, and, and added, you know, amounted to a perception which said WWF is the cool, you know, wrestling company and WCW is really uh, on the decline. That is an ab spot on observation. You know, just going back through old clips, there is a very stark difference uh, in the usage of intro themes where, yeah, there's definitely like a production factor that the, the WWF had that WCW, especially in the, in the later years, just, just didn't, um, just didn't at the same level. Uh, but not to say that there wasn't any, wasn't any good music from WCW's, um, library. Are there, are there any wrestler themes in particular, you know, looking back on your fandom that you're partial to? Well, you know what, uh, now that you mention it, uh, that that Goldberg, you know, theme. I remember, you know, watching as a as a fan back then. That was always that was always a highlight. You know, of course, his entire entrance as well. You know, what was interesting about that. It, you know, was, and I think we mentioned this in the book, once again, because that was a generic library cut, you know, WCW couldn't do anything with that music. They couldn't put it on a CD. They couldn't, um, they, they couldn't monetize that theme that they were playing, you know, uh, during the main event as many of its broadcasts because, once again, of the fact they were relying on uh, what music they had in-house. But that's, that's definitely one that comes to mind. That's crazy to me, especially because it comes from within Turner. You, you may have come across this name before, uh, Howard Helm. Uh, he was responsible, along with uh, Jimmy Hart, actually, uh, in producing a lot of kind of the final generation of WCW music when, you know, towards the end, uh, where they were sort of customizing the music a little bit more for each individual talent and if you ever get the chance to talk to him, I guarantee that would be uh, a really good fit for your podcast as well. And he can probably give you a lot more information about that. 
Oh, interesting. I will absolutely make a note of that. And I'll try to find uh, the podcast with uh, that Neil you mentioned. And if I can find the link, I will put that into the description uh, of this as well. But let's move on to your new book. It's called Grateful. It is Eric Bischoff's second memoirs that you co-wrote with him. So before we talk about the book itself, let's talk a little bit uh, about your relationship with Eric. It's uh, You spoke with Eric while putting together Nitro, and I know he has been a big advocate of yours. It was honestly through following him on social media that I, I heard about Nitro uh, because of one of his endorsements. So when you were... Uh, speaking to him uh, while putting together the Nitro book, did you uh, identify him as someone that you wanted to work with at a later point? Did you think there was more to his story, or was this something that he was impressed by your work on Nitro that he came to you for help on his second book? How did this relationship come together? Is my question. Yeah, for, you know, happily, I'm I'm glad to say I think it was more so the latter um, in terms of this book being an outgrowth of his reaction to the Nitro book being published. So, of course, in writing Nitro, uh, you know, Eric was someone that was at the top of my list in terms of people that I had to speak to. Um, you know, I was determined at the very least to, you know, move, you know, mountains to to try to get him to commit to an on-the-record interview. Um, and... You know, I would have been very disappointed at the time had he said no, but he was very gracious with his time. I think we spoke for about four hours over the course of a couple of different days. This was actually um, sort of uh, around 2015, 2016 or so. And then really, you know, I, I don't I don't recall there being, you know, too much contact thereafter. You know, I, I did those interviews with him and I really tried to ask him questions that I felt he hadn't been asked before um, because, as you know, and it, this is even more so the case now, but he's one of those people that has talked about this subject thousands, maybe tens of thousands of times by this point. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> um, you know, I, I know that he was very much at that point when I spoke to him as well, almost, almost as if, you know, almost to say, what else could I possibly say about this or what else could anyone possibly uncover? And I think once Nitro came out, you know, people realized there was a lot to the story that we didn't know before. Uh, but it was, you know, a positive experience uh, interviewing him. And then, of course, you know, when the book was published, uh, as I know, you know, you know this and anyone who's read the book knows this. Uh, there were people in the book that commented very favorably upon Eric and his tenure of running WCW and being involved with WCW. And there are other people that were not so kind and shared some stories and anecdotes that were not particularly flattering towards him. Um, and again, going back to what we said before, you know, what I try to do is try to represent all sides of that argument and all, all perspectives and, and let the reader, you know, derive from that what they may. And the book came out in July 2018. Um, I knew that within a week or two of it coming out, I knew that he was reading the book. I, I, I do remember being aware of that. But it wasn't until about August, so about a month after it came out, that all of a sudden I woke up one day and I'm getting tons of emails and messages from people saying, you know, Eric is on his podcast, 83 Weeks with Conrad Thompson, and they're just raving about this book. And so, of course, I, I took a listen. I, I was blown away that he was able to separate some of his personal feelings about some of the content in the book from his wider analysis and perspective on it. And, you know, I've said this before to him uh, and, and in other places as well. I think if any of us were to put ourselves in that position, if someone came along, an outsider ostensibly, and wrote a book about a company that we were heavily involved in, and spoke to you know 120 people um, about that company and about us in particular, and came out with a, a an account that at times was not particularly favorable towards us. How many of us would be able to say, you know what, this is still a great book? I think it's human nature in those cases to try to dismiss 
um, the work that someone's doing, you know, when you're portrayed in that light. I, I, I really do. I think it's pretty rare to be able to, to say, you know what, <laughs> I didn't like reading some of this stuff, but it's true. This is what happened. And that's essentially what he did. And so, you know, that led to uh, about a month after that, Eric and I, we, we spoke at the uh, StarCast convention in Chicago. And, uh, you know, he came up to me and he was so full of praise for the book and just said, you did you know, an amazing job. I just want to congratulate you on the book. Um, we ended up doing a panel discussion at the next StarCast convention in uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, I think that was May of 2019, uh, where the subject was WCW, but we also touched on the, the Nitro book as well. And after, after that uh, panel, you know, Eric and I kind of got to talking and we, I think we realized there was definitely a mutual respect there at this point. I think he really respected what I did with the book and how I handled things. And uh, likewise, I, I, I had only grown in, you know, respect for him based on how he had taken it all essentially and, and all of the things that he had said about the book. And, uh, you know, if you remember, it was a, a couple of months after that that Eric was rehired at the WWE. So, yeah. um, you know, that, that, that kind of put a, uh, a halt to any kind of discussion um, as to me and him working together because we did that panel and we said, you know what, we really need to, to work together on something. And then about six weeks after that, he's back, he's back with the WWE. So um, <laughs> at, at, that, at that point, I was thinking, okay, that's, that's the end of that. I'm, you know, I'll probably hear from Eric again there in a, in a few years' time. Uh, but obviously that didn't last you know, too long. And then um, once he wrapped up there, we, we really started talking about it. And it was about uh, mid sort of 2021 when we had the time to really start doing some deep dive interviews and, and discussions about everything that ended up being in the book. And um, obviously prior to that, we had decided this was going to be his, his second book. It was going to pick up where his autobiography controversy creates cash left off. Uh, so we had, we had the kind of the focus of it. We had the, um, the, uh, the title grateful, that was kind of going to be our guidepost and, and, and destination ultimately where the book was going to end up. Uh, but of course, we, you know, we didn't know how we were going to get there. And, and that was the, the interesting thing about working our way through the interview process and all of the discussions we had is, you know, um, covering everything that's happened in his life over these 15 years. I think it's uh, for the people who've read the book so far, I think it's really uh, surprising in a good way. Yeah. I enjoyed the book quite a bit. Uh, and I will say that I, I think it's also a, a big compliment that he was so impressed with your work because I one thing I know about Eric Bischoff is that in the past, he's been fairly combative uh, with people who've written about WCW, sort of in that way we've talked about earlier uh, today. You know, he, he expressed a lot of frustration about people who, you know, didn't do the proper work and research. This is his second memoirs, and... But can we talk a little bit about what your role as a co-author uh, means in a project like this? Is this recording a series of interviews? Is this fact-checking? Like, these are his stories, but I could tell a lot of this was your writing when I was reading it. You know, tell me about uh, your role in this book. Well, I think my role, more than anything, was just to try to shape, you know, the, the story and uh, try to you know, filter out, you know, what is kind of in service to our ultimate story that we're trying to tell here, which is really, you know, the journey that Eric has been on over these past 15 or 16 years, which is arriving at a point in his life today where I, I can tell you this, I've, I've had enough conversations and interactions with him now over these past, you know, seven or eight years that it's, you know, legitimate. He is at a point where um, he is truly, you know, very grateful for everything that he's experienced, the good and the bad and, and the indifferent, um, and everything that he has at this point in his life. And, you know, I think that's, um, it, it's a refreshing perspective, I think, because it's not very often today, you know, in our culture that um, we hear too much about gratitude. So to have yeah. someone 
kind of put up their hand and say, you know what? Yeah, I did. I did make some mistakes, but I also did a lot of good things in my life. And uh, you know, when I look back on it all, I'm just very grateful for the journey. That's I think that's that's pretty interesting and, and like I say, quite refreshing. So um, my my role really was to try to always make sure that whatever we were covering was in service of that story. You know, um, this this book could have probably probably been three or four times the length that it actually is based on all of the things that we covered and all of the interviews that we did. But um, we, we tried to really limit it to, um, I think, what was most particularly relevant to both wrestling fans in general and those people who've really followed Eric's career um, closely today. But, you know, the, the writing process was very much a collaborative one. So we would do you know a series of interviews and uh typically what i would do is transcribe those interviews and then i would go back and try to um identify themes within that transcript so uh i would try as much as possible to talk to him about one particular thing on on a particular day um and of course you know within that discussion we would go off in all this different kinds of tangents and directions and when I went back and look at, looked at those transcripts, I would really try to narrow down, okay, what were the four or five, let's say, themes that we discussed in this particular interview and where could that fit in the book? Is there an order that is becoming clear here? Are there some things that chronologically are gonna make sense to try to insert in a particular chapter? Or are there some other things that he touched on here that we may have to uh, kind of uh, weave in and out of the story? Um, and then I would present, you know, Eric with uh, drafts of, of kind of what I was thinking based on what he had said. You know, every word in this book is Eric's, are Eric's words. Um, and, you know, what was great about working with Eric is without fail, um, his feedback would always make those drafts better. Um, oh. I knew whatever I'm, whatever I'm presenting to him, you know, he was going to pick out a number of things that were going to only add more detail or more clarity or um, maybe, you know, he would add in a wrinkle that for whatever reason we just didn't cover when we, when we did the interview. Um, and so we kind of just bounced back and forth like that. We, we, you know, really collaborated. It was really a, a 50, 50, you know, team effort. And I had told Eric that from the start, that I didn't want this to be a situation where, he did a bunch of interviews and then I went away for a year and wrote the book and slapped his name on it. And he read it for the first time, like everyone else. Um, oh, yeah. You know, every, every, you know, which obviously, as you know, does happen. So, yeah. you know, every word in this book is, is Eric's. And, um, and like I say, he was really a, a true, you know, partner and team player throughout the whole uh, process. That's awesome to hear. That is absolutely how I would hope that projects like these are put together. And I do think you're right that it's a good quality of his that he is willing to, uh, you know, be honest with himself and others about, uh, you know, maybe mistakes he's made in the past and, you know, uh, that he, he can be humble about that kind of thing. But at, at the same time, you know, it, it is still, you know, um, a memoir. So it's his perspective. And going back to what we were talking about earlier in regards to, you know, wrestling, quote, politics, did you have conversations with him at the start of the project or at any point uh, sort of around the, the, the trappings that books like these can sometimes fall into, uh, to, to use a wrestling term, uh, putting himself over, you know, did you have conversations about how to avoid that sort of thing? Well, I think... You know what you're getting at is there are certainly a number of events or topics that are covered in this book that I mean we can confidently say that other people who are referenced in the book would certainly have a different take on um, and I think therein lies a distinction between a book like the Nitro book, which is you know trying as best as you can to get to that objective truth um, you know knowing from the beginning that you're never going to perfectly nail that story or any story because that's not you know possible quite frankly for someone to do um but th this kind of book obviously requires a different focus and takes a different shape because of the fact that it's focused around one person 
So this is, as you said, this is his perspective. These are his recollections. These are his arguments for why things, you know, went well or didn't go so well. Um, and I'm sure, you know, that will pr provide fodder for others to uh, to piggyback on and, and have their own take. And, you know, I'm sure fans will read some things and say, yeah, you know, he's spot on about that. That's exactly how I remember it. And there might be some other things, you know, they may have a different take. But um, I would like to think that we struck a, a, a nice balance overall. And I, and I say that because... Um, there are a number of sections in the book where I think Eric is painfully honest about some of the low times that he's experienced over these past 15 years. So I think specifically about, you know, the section in the book where he talks about how difficult it was for him to do personal appearances, um, yeah. which may sound, which may, you know, may sound like a, a trivial thing. And I'm sure all of us, you know, uh, on the outside looking in would say that that sounds like a dream gig. You know, I just go somewhere and sign autographs and get paid to do it. What, what, why are you complaining about that? But to hear him talk about the fact that, you know, he was quite frankly embarrassed by the fact that he didn't look like the person on the eight by tens he was signing. And, sure. you know, he felt, he felt that he was in a position where he had to do these things because of the financial situation and, you know, bankruptcy specifically that he talks about in the book um, I think that it's it's quite rare to read in any um, autobiography, uh, um, you know, especially in in this particular genre, to see someone be so you know honest about some of those low times as well. So, you know, are there are there moments where you know he's reflecting uh, and, and sort of waxing poetically about some of the great things he's done in the business? Of course, um, you know that's that's true to who he is i think he's he's very proud of those things but um at the same time you know we definitely uh, i would like to think that we definitely didn't skip over some of those low times as well yeah absolutely well put okay uh last question about this book uh, one of the coolest aspects of the book are the qr codes that you've included at the end of each chapter and i don't know how much you want to get into this aspect of it because it was a surprise to me when I was reading through, but scanning those codes and watching some of the content that comes up um, from them it was just something I haven't seen in a uh, book before. I thought that's just brilliant and such a great way to provide the reader with supplemental material. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what some of that uh, material is and what made you think to include it? Yeah, well, that was uh, that was Eric's idea. You know, he actually oh, okay. got that idea. He he got that idea from another author, but he uh, he approached me with that that concept and said, "I think this would be a way to give some added value to the reader, to to surprise them with something that, again, might be different from a lot of other wrestling books that they've read." Uh, so I have to, you know, give him credit for that. And you know, as, as you mentioned, at the end of each chapter, there's a QR code that readers can scan, and that will take you to in most cases, a video interview with one of the uh, principal people discussed in, in that particular chapter. Um, some some of those people are you know, Eric's family. Some of them are uh, people that he worked with uh, in, in the business. You know, Lex Luger would, would be one example that many people listening to oh. us would probably know. Um, and, uh, and others are, uh, you know, actually people who we sort of solicited to give some broader context to some of the things that were talked about in the book. So for example, chapter three of Grateful covers Eric's recollections of uh, the aftermath of the, the terrible Chris Benoit uh, double murder, you know, suicide yep. in, uh, in 2007. So, you know, when we considered, okay, you know, what can we do here to provide that supplemental material to go along with this chapter? What we decided to do is reach out to a guy by the name of Sam Ford, who previously taught a uh, course on pro wrestling, actually at MIT. And he is a, a, a brilliant guy to talk about, you know, a number of subjects, but particularly pro wrestling. And so if you scan that, QR code, it will take you to a, about a 15 minute conversation between Sam and I, where he's really 
stepping back 15 years removed and kind of taking you through a journey of what happened, what the impact was on the wrestling business, how WWE dealt with that tragedy, you know, what the response from the company may have been if God forbid, you know, anything like that uh, or remotely close to that ever happened again. So it just kind of goes back to our underlying philosophy, which again was to give the reader something different, but also to give them some variety. So that when they scan those QR codes, it, it, as I say, it might be someone from Eric's family. It might be a wrestler. It might be someone taking you off in a completely different direction. But um, I think it, it really does enhance people's overall enjoyment of the book. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think that it packs a little bit more into the phrase money's worth. You know, if anyone has a, uh, you know, frustration that the the book isn't uh, as long as maybe it could be, well, here's that supplemental content that, that you get in a in a different way. I think that's just an excellent way to do it. So uh, tip of the hat for that. Uh, I saw on Twitter not too long ago that you teased some big things for 2023. Are you able to give a preview of what you're working on for this year? Hopefully very soon. Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that. Uh, there's definitely a number of things in the works. So uh, hopefully in the next couple of months, I'll be able to uh, give some more details on that. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, and then this is just a, a question about your, your writing career in general. I mean, one thing I we didn't mention, I mean, Nitro is your first book and you come out of the gates with such, you know, a powerhouse piece. Is this is professional wrestling as a whole a, a topic that you plan to revisit in your future, or do you hope to expand to other, you know, works of nonfiction or, or, or even fiction? Yeah, I would certainly say, well, I should start by saying that, you know, when I put together the Nitro book, and of course we talked about all the reasons for doing that previously, uh, it was really my intent for this to kind of be my contribution to, I suppose, the world of wrestling literature or whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah. You know, I thought, I thought I'll thought i come out with this book and I'm sure maybe a couple dozen people or something will read it and maybe it'll make a splash for a couple of weeks and, you know, that'll be the end of that. And uh, little did I know what, what it was going to turn into, which was really a life-changing experience, um, you know, and... Obviously, when you get that kind of reaction to your first book um, and, and such a positive reaction, you know, it would be foolish not to continue to explore that particular area. So I think that's a, a long way of saying that, um, you know, the answer really is that the, I would like to do both things. You know, I'd like to mm. continue providing, uh, you know, books for people who are interested in in, in wrestling, whether that be you know, what we would maybe consider, I don't know if you want to call it the golden age, maybe a golden age in the history of wrestling, sure. uh, or, or whether it's, you know, people who are fans of contemporary wrestling. Uh, but also I think, you know, uh, one of the uh, one of the things that I would like to do moving forward is to try to expand into some some other areas as well, because, you know, like anyone else, there's a number of things that I'm, you know, interested in and, and I, I'm, I'm confident that, um, you know, some, some good books can come out of that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, what would you say is the best way for uh, fans to get a hold of your books? I see on Twitter you're posting sales for them all the time, so I know they're, uh, you know, they got some good prices on them, but what's the best way to, for fans to get their hands on them? Yeah, well, uh, let me just say, Joe, you know, because I know we're wrapping up, I really do appreciate uh, you reaching out, and it was it was really nice talking to you, and hopefully we'll have the chance to do it again. Um, to answer your question, the best place to go would simply be GuyEvansBooks.com. Uh, if you go to that website, you'll see links to both the Nitro book and Grateful uh, in all of the various formats that the books are available in. Um, if you're someone who prefers to order your books from Amazon, you can just search for my name on there as well. Uh, Guy Evans, The Nitro Book, and Grateful are both on, on Amazon worldwide. Uh, the Nitro Book actually is also on Audible. So if you're someone who prefers oh. to listen rather than read your books, you can also download that. And here's something that uh, Eric and I actually will be talking about in the next couple of days. Um, Eric is going to be recording 
the audio version of Grateful, which will also be released on Audible, um, hopefully in the next few months. We're hoping oh. that, you know, possibly sort of April, May, uh, we can get that out. And so I know, you know, there's a ton of people who've reached out to us saying, you know, guys, I really want to read this book, but I really just prefer if you came out with the audio book first. And it's actually amazing how big that mar- that market is. So, uh, you know, that's uh, that's something people can look out for as well. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. That that has become a, a, a huge deal in the uh, publishing world. Well, uh, Guy, I just want to say I, I really appreciate this conversation. I've enjoyed this talk a lot. I absolutely love both of these books. Uh, Nitro in particular totally knocked my socks off, and I can I can say with, <laughs> with total certainty, whatever you have coming down the pipeline, count me on board. I'm into it, and... Uh, when you do have uh, a new project to unveil, please come back and, and, and talk with us again, because this has been a real treat, man. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate that, too, and I'll definitely keep that in mind, Joe. And, you know, hearing stuff like that, it makes, uh, makes all the work worthwhile. So thank you. Awesome. Okay. Well, take care of yourself, Guy. You have a good one. Yes, sir. You too. Thanks, Joe. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember the big four things you can do to support this show that don't cost a dime. Number one, listen to the show. If you're hearing this now, that means you did this part already. Thank you. There is an infinite amount of content out there, so you choosing to spend some time listening to this show means a great deal to me. Number two, if you like what we did here, please recommend this show to family, friends, or anyone you know who's looking for a podcast, particularly about music. Share our links in Facebook groups, subreddits, and recommendation threads. Whatever you can do is highly appreciated on my end. Number three, find us on social media. Follow us on Twitter at PlayThatPodcast. Like us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash PlayThatPodcast. And subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash play that rock and roll. Lots of great material like photos and vlogs on all three platforms. As play that rock and roll is very much meant to be a content hub as well as a podcast. And finally, the big ask. Number four, please give us a five star rating and a positive review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. I know this part is a hassle, but it really does help the show a great deal. Not just because it affects the algorithm, but also because it gives me something I can point to when pitching this show to potential guests. The more social media followers and positive ratings the show has, the better chance I have for booking high-profile guests for interviews. So if you take a moment to give us even just a five-star rating, you are actively giving us a tool to do bigger and better things here. But whatever the case, I appreciate any and all efforts you take to support us here at Play That Rock and Roll. Be sure to join us next time for more great stories and music from the world of classic rock. Classic rock.